Let's do a children's lesson. Will you come up and help me do a children's lesson? Just stay right there. What's your name? Savannah. Savannah. Say good morning to Savannah. Good morning. All right, Savannah, we're coming right up here, okay? You're going to stand right up here so they can see you. All right? So you are going to be my helper. So what is this, folks? What kind of box? It's a shoe box. What do you think is inside of the shoe box? Anybody? Shoes? Well, Savannah is going to be the only person who knows what's inside this shoe box, but she's not going to tell you until I say you can. Okay? All right, so here you go, Savannah. Hold the box, and I'm going to open the lid. All right, now you look in. Don't say anything. All right, got a good look? Mm -hmm. All right. Now, hold on to the box. Savannah is the only one here who knows what's in the shoe box. So we would call her an eyewitness. Do you know what an eyewitness is? What's an eyewitness? This is not a rhetorical question. Come on, give me an answer. <laughs> Someone who has seen something that others have not seen. You understand that? All right. So an eyewitness can be like if mom and dad see an accident on the, on the street, the police will stop them and say, what did you see? Right. So they'll tell them what they saw. Right. So you are an eyewitness. Okay. All right. You're the only one who knows what's in that shoebox. Don't tell anybody. Hmm. Here's the point. We have eyewitnesses about the life of Jesus. They were eyewitnesses. They were there. They witnessed with their eyes and their ears the life of Jesus. They witnessed his death on the cross and resurrection. All right, stay focused okay. with me. Don't worry hmm. about mom and dad. Hmm. All right? So... Can you name any eyewitnesses for, of Jesus? Matthew. Matthew. Luke. L well, Luke wrote later. Name me some other ones. Peter, Peter and John and James and the women, right? Mm -hmm. They saw, they were with Jesus during his ministry. They were there through his death on the cross and they saw him risen from the dead, right? So now those eyewitnesses have written down for us what they saw. So we, as we come to Holy Week, we believe what they wrote, right? Correct? All right. Now, Savannah, mm. it's your turn to tell them. Let's open the box. We've got to make this dramatic. <laughs> tell them what is in the box. Actually, go ahead. Flowers. Flowers. Why don't you pull it out? There are the flowers. Anybody guess flowers? No. Yeah, you did. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So that's the point, okay? okay? We believe what the eyewitnesses wrote about Jesus in his life, death, and resurrection. All okay. right. Thank you. Let's give her a thank you. Take out your Bibles and turn to uh, Philippians chapter 2, which you will find on page 1827. Philippians chapter 2, page 1827. And we're going to read verses 5 through 11. And this is what is known as an early Christian creed or an early Christian hymn. All right? So, let us read it together. All right, would you join me? Page 1827, Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, 
taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, the name of Jesus. Every knee should bow, <coughs> and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now please turn to Mark chapter 14, page 1578. Mark chapter 14. Palm Sunday, of course, is the gateway to Holy Week. And this week, we're going to take all of the readings from St. Mark's Gospel. And the reason I chose this one today is because we seldom hear of this lovely story by this wonderful woman who does a beautiful, lovely act of kindness and devotion for the Lord Jesus Christ before his passion. Now, if you look at chapter 14, the first 11 verses, you will see that this lovely story is surrounded by two ominous records. The first is the conspiracy of the Jewish leadership to arrest and ultimately kill Jesus, and it ends up with the betrayal of Judas. So here's how we're going to do this. I'm going to read the first two verses and the last two, and you're going to read the lovely story of Jesus' anointing. Let me begin. Now the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread were only two days away. The chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some sly way to arrest Jesus and kill him. But not during the feast, or the people may riot. Go ahead. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money. So he watched for an opportunity to hand him over. Keep your Bibles open. Sermon today is in three parts. First of all, the conspiracy. The conspiracy against Jesus had been going on for some time. The decision to arrest Jesus had been decided months before Holy Week. Many of us think that all of this came about the last week of his life, and that is just not true. For probably a year or longer, there had been plans to get rid of this Jesus of Nazareth from Galilee. Caiaphas was the high priest during this time, and he said a very wise thing. He said, it is expedient that one man should die instead of losing all so many of the, in, of the Jews in the nation. In other words, it's much better that only one dies instead of a whole bunch of bloodshed by, at the hands of the Romans. Now, he said that because of this. The conspiracy came about for several reasons. The first were political reasons. 
They were afraid, the Jewish leadership were afraid, and they had good reason to be afraid, that if this followed its course, there could be another uprising, another messianic uprising, and the Romans would come, as they had done many times before, they would come and kill a bunch of people and squash it. That was a reality. And by the way, we know that, that, and we know from history outside the Bible, that there were numerous times during Roman occupation where someone rose up as a messianic character and the Romans came in. They were afraid, the Jewish leadership were afraid that this would be just another time the Romans would come in, bring revenge, they would bring in their legions of soldiers and slaughter a bunch of people. And that's exactly what happened 35 years after this time. Remember that? That's what happened in the years 66 to 70 AD. There was another uprising. And what did the Romans do? They came in, destroyed the temple, and estimates are that they killed more than a million Jews. It was a bloodthirsty group that, that they were. Okay? So the Jewish leadership had to preserve the safety of the people and it was a delicate compromise between Jewish and Roman authority. That is why they did not want to arrest Jesus publicly. They were looking for some sly, some way to arrest him where nobody knew and that's where Judas comes in. We'll talk about him at the end of the sermon for today. Okay? You have to understand that the Passover was a tremendous political sort of like our Independence Day. And for the Jews, that was their independence from Egyptian slavery. And every time they came to Jerusalem, every year, those patriotic feelings rose and they were hoping that there would be another Moses who would release and relieve them from foreign oppression. Now, what were the other reasons? Anybody? Political reasons, certainly. Any, any others? Re religious reasons and personal reasons. In the minds of the Jewish leadership, Jesus was a dangerous man. In their minds, they thought he was a hoax that he was this miracle worker everybody was talking about, they in fact accused him of being part of Satan's work in this world. They, he was not more than a mere man, that he was dangerous and they thought him to be a fraud and a hoax and he needed to be done away with. But they also got rid of him for personal reasons. Yes, they wanted to maintain their religious stature, but they disliked him. Because Jesus called them names, like brood of vipers, and he said, you steal widows' homes. They hated him. They wanted to get rid of him. Part two of the sermon, the story. Here comes this unnamed woman. I tend to believe that she had to have some previous contact with Jesus. Maybe not, but it seems that she did. She comes into the home of Simon the leper. He must have been healed of his leprosy, otherwise the folks would not have been there. And she comes in seemingly, quietly and on her own, and she has this little alabaster vial which contains very expensive perfumed oil. And she breaks it, pours the oil out, and pours it over Jesus' head. The disciples, Matthew says, they became indignant. They said, well, this is such a waste. Why did she do this? We could have what? Sold it and given the money to the poor. Jesus comes to her defense. He says, leave her alone. What she has done is a beautiful thing for me. And then he says, she has anointed me and prepared my body for burial. Let's focus on the woman. It's interesting, we, here's another woman who comes now with deep devotion, with deep love, and she does a lovely thing with charm. The word that is used of her act in verse 6 is called a beautiful thing. Not a good thing, 
but a beautiful thing, that she did something with charm. She did something of great devotion and love and affection. With great emotion, she doesn't count the cost. She doesn't give the least. She gives the most. Sounds like who? The widow in the temple. She gives this extravagant gift, may have been an heirloom of the family, very expensive gift, and she breaks it, never to be used again. In, and she doesn't count the cost in an extravagant, giving the most she could. She performs this act of devotion that the disciples don't even get, but Jesus sees. And that brings the word of application for us today. We too need to have an emotional devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm afraid that one of our problems in American Christianity is that for many of us, it's a cerebral connection with the Lord Jesus. As we enter Holy Week, I want to challenge you that this week you connect on a personal, emotional level with the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm preparing my sermons now for the next, for this week, and I'm going through his trials and with under the Sanhedrin and Pilate and all of that and the crucifixion. And you know, I'm going to tell you, every year I go through this, there, for me, there is this deep emotional connection of what he went through for me and for the world. And I think many times we give Jesus our little, what is least. We count the cost. We count the cost of what is this going to cost me in time and energy. And many times we don't give Jesus the best. We don't give him the best of our emotions and the best of our service and devotion. We give him the least, the little. And you know where it shows itself? In our, in our half-hearted worship and praise. It shows itself in our half-hearted service to him in his kingdom. It shows itself in, well, when I have time, then I'll think about him. And I want to say to you this week, journey to the cross. Be in God's house. Read the passion. And if you have an opportunity, watch a movie. I want to invite you to watch this movie tonight on, on the National Geographic channel. It's at 8 o'clock. It's entitled, anybody know? Yeah. Killing Jesus. You know, there are some movies about Jesus that I just absolutely hate because they make him to be a, fa a fake character. Remember, remember the uh, Passion of the Christ a couple years ago? That was probably very accurate, folks. And you know, we tend to think of it cerebrally. But we have to connect with the person of Jesus who goes to Jerusalem, is spit upon, hit, mocked, ridiculed, rejected, suffers this horrendous crucifixion because of his love for the Father and because of his love for you and me. And I want to ask you this week, this year, this, but this week, take the time to have that deep devotional connection to the Lord Jesus Christ. And not a shallow, not a little, not when I have time. But let it be real to you that affects your life. Part three of the sermon is Judas. In contrast to this woman, with this deep devotion, now comes Judas and his treachery. Judas doesn't just run away from Jesus. He doesn't just abandon him. He what? He takes the offensive to what? To betray him and have him killed. That's the deal. Why does Judas do this? Why does Judas do this? Let's ask this side. The money? No. He thinks Jesus is going to rise up retaliate and be the Messiah the soldier. Okay. So perhaps he's trying to force Jesus' hand. Put him in a position where he's forced to follow or forced to use divine power. Money, 
That's a good one. Anybody else? I think Judas thought that the Lord was supposed to be the king, a human king. So you think he was disappointed in Jesus? Yes. Yeah, I think those, all those answers are probably in the mix. A number of people that I, uh, the sources that I use said this. By the way, it also appears Judas told the high priest a lot about Jesus. Has Judas given up on Jesus? Has Jesus betrayed what Judas thought was the cause of bringing in the mighty kingdom of God? Jesus pursues a pointless course toward what? Toward death. A pointless cause. Perhaps Judas was disappointed in Jesus' failure to use force. Maybe he was disillusioned and thought of Jesus as a false prophet or false messiah. Perhaps he was trying to force his hand. Or maybe it was just about the money. What would 30 pieces of silver get you in Jesus' day? A new suit of clothes. I think it was deeper than that. I think I wonder, you know, it's one of the one of the great questions of the passion. It probably is a bunch of these things, and I think it was much more than the money. So this week, spend time with the Lord Jesus Christ. Spend time with his word. Read the passion. Make that deep personal connection to the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. In Jesus' name, amen.